I'm Jennifer Byrne here in Perth and I'm about to speak to one of the literary greats. Over 50 years she's won just about every prize, she's written in just about every form but it's for her novels that Margaret Atwood is best known. The Handmaid's Tale, The Blind Assassin, Oryx and Crake, I'm sure we all have our favourites. But let's go and meet the author, Canada's finest, Margaret Atwood. Now, Margaret, I would like to start, if I may, near the beginning, which is your childhood. You had a most unusual childhood by today's standards, um, born in Ottawa, but you spent at least half the year up in the northern woods. I was born in 1939 in November, which puts it two months after the beginning of World War II. Um, and then six months after that event, which took place in Ottawa. I went into the wilderness in a pack sack, and um, we did spend th three quarters of the year. Uh, why was that? Because my father was a forest entomologist. He studied insects that eat trees, and um, they don't do anything in the winter. So in the winter, <laughs> we would be in a city. Well, while he wrote up the results, but they become active in the spring, summer, and um, gradually diminish in the fall. So he was tracking them during those times. And as I understand it, it was a very creative environment. You painted. You well, I think faute de mieux. I mean, there wasn't anything else to do when it rained. So yes. <laughs> and did we have a lot of art supplies? No. Uh, it was the war, and um, so we had some pencils. And stories? We had books. Um, but once you had read all of the books, you read them all again because there wasn't a library. Between the age of eight yes. and 20... Um, That's quite a big slice too. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so it got a lot. taller, but, but not a lot. <laughs> a lot of some of the, what we would now regard as the science fiction classics came out. Um, so, I mean, Brave New World had been out for a while, but we had 1984, um, Fahrenheit, 451, um, Animal Farm. Chronicles. Animal Farm was a bit earlier, yeah. Animal Farm was early enough for me to read it as a uh, child, thinking it was going to be Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> it had animals in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, I was what devastated was it like to by read that. those. I mean, we, we see them as such the great classics, but when they came out, was it exciting, or they, were they just another book that came along? Well, in those in those days, um, it was the days of the of the paperback had really just hit. So one of the first disintermediators was the arrival of the paperback book. Before that, there had been cheap hardbacks, but when the paperback hit, a whole new world was possible. So you could go into your local pharmacy and find the paperback book rack. And on that rack, there might be um, William Faulkner, but with a very lurid cover, you know. <laughs> sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> good one. <laughs> well, and you and, and people were, were thereby exposed to a lot of classics, but they didn't know that they were classics because they had these really cheesy covers on them. And my first copy of 1984 had such a cover, so I thought, oh, good, here's a <laughs> here's a cheesy book, uh, because of course teenagers do like to read those. Um, you find out about life by reading Peyton Place on the roof of the garage where nobody will see you doing it. And uh, a great shocker it was. I found out about varicose veins through <laughs> What are these? <laughs> and other adult things. Uh, so, I, so you just, you read a lot of, you, you really, I read, I read just any, anything that there was. Yes. So a wide range of, uh, of book experiences, thanks to those lurid covers. Uh, and, so but uh, there wasn't any sense in 1984, this is 
hugely important, or Fahrenheit 451. I mean, it didn't scream at you, this is going to be a great sign. Oh, kids don't think that way. You know, it was, it was like Donovan's brain. You don't know about Donovan's brain, do you? I don't brain, know do about you? Donovan's okay, brain. Okay, so when you're reading things that are just coming out, you have no idea what's going to be a classic. You're just, you're, you're reading whatever there is. Donovan's brain is one in which Donovan's brain um, survives an airplane crash and gets put into a fish tank by some scientists who think that if they feed it brain food, they will get the super brain that will solve the problems of the universe. But Donovan had been a stock manipulator in life. And uh, he didn't know he was dead, being just a, a brain. You know, you, you wouldn't, would you? No. Uh, <laughs> so he just wanted to keep on manipulating the stocks and take o taking over the world. But unfortunately, due to the brain food, he, de he, he developed the uh, powers of an electric eel. So that anybody who tried to pull out the plug on his fish tank, once they realized what he was up to, uh, he would electrocute them. <laughs> I am with his, with his brain. I am amazed that that did not go down in the pantheon of great books from that era. But you can find it on the online with full description. <laughs> Thank you. And it is the only um, novel of that kind. In fact, it's the only novel of that kind. But it's the only novel of that kind in which the problem is solved through French poetry. <laughs> because uh, Donovan doesn't know French. And so the person manages to recite to himself a French poem while sneaking up on the electric plug. And uh, Donovan doesn't realize what is about to happen until that plug is removed from the wall. And? Come on, we're all with you now. Yes. Well, our hero does get electrocuted, but he has sacrificed himself in a good cause because that's the end of Donovan <laughs> taking over the Thank world. Thank you. I think, yes. <laughs> Remember what I said about the kind of the giants of modern literature? Yeah, so, so 1984 was, of course, a vastly superior literary production. But, <laughs> but to an adolescent reader of, say, 14, they were, they were much the same. And that, that's how come. I mean, Stephen King has, has caused many an adolescent boy to become literate um, because they, they don't actually want to read Madame Bovary at that age. Um, but they can sneak into it through reading Stephen King at that age, yeah. if you see what I mean. Can I um, jump forward to, to 1985, which is the date The Handmaid's Tale? Yes, I, I cornily started writing it in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't yeah. believe I'm doing this, but I, I did. You had yeah, five novels published already. They were contemporary, and all of a sudden come the, came The Handmaid's Tale. I was interested... At the time, was that a, a big decision? Did the publishers have any say of it? Did Are they you say? joking? No, I, I, never, if, you, you, I never tell them what I'm going to do because they would tell me not to do it. <laughs> That's so, what I was getting at. Did, yes. Would they have told you not to do oh, it? Oh, yes, they would certainly have told me not to do it uh, because it would have been too weird for them. Um, so the best thing is not to tell them and just spring it on them. <laughs> And so when you said of it that um, it gave you a strange feeling to write The Handmaid's Tale like sliding on a river of ice, what did that mean? Sliding on thin ice, yes. Um, well, it was a bit chancy, don't you think? <laughs> it's hard to imagine now because, of course, it's become a classic of its own. But yes, I do think, I would think that for someone who hadn't been in those waters before, it would be quite scary. Well, the subject matter uh, was controversial. Um, yes, it was, a, it was a risky thing to do, but usually I've got about three possible things that I might be writing, and I, you know, being a lazy person, I, I start writing the less risky one, and then I think this is <laughs> dead boring. Um, <laughs> And then I migrate into the riskier one, and that seems to be a repeating pattern. So you never actually get to see the ones that I might have written otherwise at the time. Really? Well, because I don't finish them. <laughs> one of the, the, the rules you set for yourself, which I found so interesting, was when you wrote The Handmaid's Tale, was that you would not have anything in the book that had not happened, and in Western 
societies already, and that was not already technologically Possible. achievable. Yes, uh, sometimes somewhere, it didn't have to be a Western society, but sometimes somewhere that, that little item, that little uh, ficto factoid uh, had to have occurred. So including the dress codes, including the group hangings, um, including the forbidding of reading, which has happened multiple times, uh, including the child stealing, you know, and anything you can mention, it has happened. It was a brilliant idea. Did it come to you when you started writing or it... it you mean not to have anything that hadn't actually happened? Mm, because it made oh, it, it more chilling. Was, it was just a very practical thing that people were going to say, you certainly have a warped imagination, you weird, twisted person. And I would be able to say, actually, it's all happened. So it's not me that's weird and twisted, it's human history. Mm. Um, as, as The Handmaid's Tale came out, it was a great success that was shortlisted for the book. Or I think Actually, it, it wasn't a great success at the beginning. It won the Arthur C. Clarke Award, though, didn't it? Later, yes. That was, it won the first Arthur C. Clarke Award. So, so when, you re, when you win the first of something that doesn't have a long history of having been won, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not necessarily the big splash uh, that you might think <laughs> Looking back, it's important. Yeah, and I'm very fond of it. But at the time, I thought, what's this? What's this? Um, I've actually won the, you're, you may not know this, I've won the Swedish Humor Award. <laughs> so my, no wonder you look proud. I look very proud, yes. And my four Swedish publishers had to go off in a rainstorm to collect it, and it was in an amphitheater without a cover on, so they got soaked. And the Swedish Humor Award was a big crystal bowl, which, which somebody then stole. So I don't, <laughs> although I've won the Swedish Humor Award, I don't have the Swedish Humor Award. <laughs> now, of course, you sit be before us as someone who has won the Swedish prize for comedy. So, yes. But then you were, frankly, in the 70s, you were regarded as a very fierce person. In fact, you know, one would hear people still, coming away from interviews yes. with you saying, Phew, I got through it, I made it. Were they wimpy or you were? No, I was very kind. <laughs> I'm still very kind. <laughs> but people don't, uh, you know, you've heard the expression, just don't start. <laughs> well, they just don't start. <laughs> Whereas they used to all the time, they really provocative things like, what makes you think you can be a writer? And I certainly haven't read any of your books and I'm not going to, so tell me in 25 words or less what your book is about. <laughs> like that. Really? So you can see how that might be a bit annoying. Deeply. <laughs> yes. But that's what it was like. So, so would you have sat still for that either? No. No, 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 no wouldn't. you wouldn't have. In fact, I did actually look back on YouTube. There is a, an interview with you done at that time where someone keeps saying, your books are so grim, they're so grim. Oh, I think this would be Hannah Gartner. Yes. They never actually broadcast that at the time because it was so awful. It was, it was bad. <laughs> but they've put it up now because now we're in the digital age and people are combing through their archives to get every ludicrous and weird thing that they can just to put up and get an audience. So yes, that's up there mm -hmm. and I bet she's sorry now. <laughs> You said somewhere, and I thought it was a beautiful way of dealing with this, was saying that you said, it took me a long time to realise that, you know, I, I was not, compared to the rest of my family, that fierce, but that being the youngest in a family of dragons, you're still a dragon, from the point of view of those who find dragons frightening. That's true. Is that right? Yes, but re remember when I first, um, I, pub I published The Edible Woman in 1969, having written it in 64, mind you, the publisher then lost the manuscript, but that wasn't my fault. Um, For five years he lost well, it? Well, it was Canada. It was, um, <laughs> I didn't know any better. Wouldn't happen in America. Well, it probably wouldn't happen now, because now there's the internet, and you would send the person a lot of emails saying, where's my manuscript? But I, I didn't know what was supposed to happen. I didn't have an agent. Canadians didn't have agents then. And um, I just thought it was taking a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it was taking a long time, but it may, m meant that it came out right at, right at the peak of the early uh, women's movement, 
installment two to distinguish it from installment one, Suffragettes. Um, and people therefore thought that it either, that it had come out of that movement, whereas in fact it was pre that movement. But I did get a lot of questions like, um, do men like you and things like that. <laughs> You were embraced lovingly by the feminists, and you didn't really want to be you on know, any that woman hug who, that time. Any woman you? who had ever written a book that wasn't about cooking was embraced by the feminists at that time because they were, <laughs> because there was a shortage of things to embrace. So, so yes, and, and thank you very much. I was happy uh, to be embraced. Um, so I was on the one hand embraced in that way and on the other hand by people who hadn't heard yet that there was a feminist movement. Uh, they wrote reviews saying, um, well, this is an immature book, but she'll, she'll become more mature later. <laughs> I always wondered when I, I mean, in 1993, you wrote a, a book called The Robber Bride, which I thought was one of your most fun books about Xenia, this ghastly man-stealing sisterhood, you know, bashing. She was, she was a force of evil she's and a, She's a female con artist. And uh, I think I wrote it partly because somebody said to me that there weren't any female con artists. Little did they know. They had never, they had never run across anybody doing the cancer con, which is a favorite among female con artists. You know, I've got cancer, feel sore for me, give me money. And then you find out that actually they don't. Mm. Like that. But she ran off with every... She was the ultimate um, betraying the sisters. And I wondered if that was part of your... T to the feminists. No, not at all. No? I, I mean, my, the thing about feminists and is... And I, I, I could get everybody in this room to vote as a feminist simply by going back in history and saying, OK, so do you believe in education for women? Hands up. Who does? Do you believe in them being allowed to read? Um, do you believe in them being allowed to have jobs? And you can work your way all, all the way up to, to leg shaving, you know? <laughs> then there might be some differences of opinion, but um, up to that point, everybody now pretty much agrees with those positions that were fiercely debated in, in past history. So my position is that women are human beings, but that means that like other human beings, them, you know, those other human beings. <laughs> them. The, the ones with the other crimes. Those ones, yes. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes and degrees of moral probity. So just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you're nicer, better, sweeter, kinder, uh, or any of those things. In fact, I remember Doris Lessing, who, of course, wrote one of the seminal texts of feminism, who I interviewed a few years ago. And uh, She wouldn't like you calling... I mean, the feminists wouldn't like you calling it a seminal text. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But what was amazing was that she, who had been so embraced, she said, she said, what a lot of bitches have been turned out by the feminist movement. They, it, 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 she'd completely recanted. Strange. Well, I, why should any, be, anybody be surprised that, that not all women are the same as all other women? I mean, yes. <laughs> they take different dress sizes, too. <laughs> what were you saying were the four requirements of being a writer? Oh, there are four kinds of books. Yeah, there are only four kinds of books in relation to money. Okay, good books that make money, bad books that make money, good books that don't make money, and bad books that don't make money. <laughs> and <laughs> of those four, you can live with three of them. <laughs> and you have had the talent and, um, and judgment that you managed to write popular books, good books. Not on purpose. That sell. <laughs> Come on. Yes, no. No, this, is, this, is, this becomes a sore point, particularly in France. You write the best sellers. Sneer. I sneer at you. <laughs> 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 to which you have to reply, not on purpose. <laughs> it's a byproduct. Uh, so, yes, I've been lucky in that I've been able to write what I wanted. 
uh, and also that I started early enough before any of this sort of market talk set in with these millions of advice blogs telling you how to sell yourself and all this kind of thing. Uh, so it's partly our fault. It's partly the fault of our generation. We invented the book tour. We invented the literary festival. <laughs> for She's instance, say she hates us. for instance, then the workshop, the workshop, and the um, creative writing class that you can take at a university. None of that existed in 1960. And was that better, that it didn't exist? Was it better or worse that it didn't exist? Um, there's an upside and a downside to everything. Some people ask me, they say, well, is it better for a young writer now uh, than it was in your day? And the answer to that is it's probably harder because there are so many uh, people who want to do it and so many... Um, institutions that are quite happy to tell them that they can, um, which isn't always true, but, but never mind, it was never always true. Whereas for us, there were a lot fewer outlets, but there were also a lot fewer people thinking that they wanted to be writers. In fact, it was a deeply strange thing to say that you wanted to be, particularly if you were female in 1960. So why would you? They, 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 didn't, they didn't even say, you can't do that because you're a girl. They said, what? <laughs> you, you want to be what? You want to do what? More like that. Whereas now they will say, oh, well, we, kn we know this great course you can take. Is there for you um, a great stylist who you admire? Is there a, is there a gold standard um, of writing that you look at that person or look at that work and say, I really admire that? Am I allowed to say Shakespeare? You can say whoever you like. If, if that's you the go truth. look at, yeah, you know, if you look at, and I know, yes, he's been around, we blah, 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 we take him in school, etc. But if you actually look again closely at what he accomplished, it's staggering. Um, so, yes, I, whenever I'm feeling uh, that I'm fed up with all of that, I, I go back and, and take a look at Shakespeare again, which is. So he's your gold standard? Well, not that you could ever be like him. Uh, although people have said, well, there's two, essentially two kinds of writers. There's, there's Shakespeare and Milton. And everything that Milton wrote was Milton. And everything that Shakespeare wrote was all of the characters that he wrote. You can't look at any one of them and say, that's Shakespeare. He is, he is the variety of, of what he wrote. And I think I, I, I admire that. Um, I would rather be Shakespeare than Milton for quite a few reasons. <laughs> I, think, I think he had a lot more fun, just, just for starters. <laughs> I was wondering, does it, does it, is, is the book you're currently working on, is it always the best? Or as it is, Ian McEwen once said, not just the worst, it's the hardest. <laughs> it's always the one you're in love with. And you can see that it would have to be so. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best, just as in real life. In other words, because you're in love with someone doesn't necessarily mean, as we all know, that they are a superior human product. <laughs> They just happen to be who you're in love with right then. Uh, so of course you think they're wonderful. And sometimes you're right. And sometimes you're not right. <laughs> and so you serially fall in love with your books? You, you have to, because otherwise why would you bother? Why would you bother spending time uh, with this entity if you weren't in love with them? And is it still really hard work? It's work in that you have to put in the time. But if you're not also enjoying it, I mean, I think we have this idea about the word work, that there's work and there's play. Um, and writing, I think, has to be both. So we need another word for that. Uh, let's make one Craft? Up. No, I think we need to combine work and play, so plurk. <laughs> 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 
unless it's, unless it's on some level deeply involving and enjoyable, why would you do it? And I, I know we have a lot of, I suffer so much, and that's true too. Um, but overall, it has to be something that's involving you and holding your attention at a very deep level, or else why would you do it unless, unless you just are churning it out? For instance, Winston Smith's job in 1984 is, is, in, the, is in the cheap fiction uh, machine of that world, and they're just churning them out. They're a product. So if all you want to do is write a product, you can get a handbook about how to do that. <clears throat> First kiss on page 62, etc. Uh, but even that, I think you have to have a feel for it or you're not going to be very good at it, at writing um, Harlequin's Mills and Boons. Those are the ones with the handbook. <laughs> Margaret Atwood, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you about your life and plurk. Thank you very much. <laughs>